Even as Virginia parents continue to be frustrated by school districts ignoring their concerns about sexually explicit content, the U.S. Supreme Court is considering a case that would help expand education alternatives for parents. Will this help empower more parents right here in the Commonwealth? Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, and I'm joined today by our president, Victoria Cobb. Well, before we get into today's topic, since it's the Christmas season, I thought we should just, you know, kind of mutually share our fun stories or maybe not so funny stories about the experience of Christmas decorating. Victoria, you go first. Well, the, I mean, in our house, the classic one was our first Christmas where we both go to Target to pick out lights. And I go to the white lights, he goes to the color lights. And I mean, forevermore, I mean, if we were there an hour, we left without lights. Now, 20 years into the marriage, we now rotate, one year's color, one year's light. We've gotten through it. But this year, we added a new complexity with the outside lights, trying to... It's, it's a long story, but like, you know, you try to put up this garland and a wreath and then and then we put a tree out on our porch and you're trying to connect it so you don't have a million wires. Right now, we have still not solved it because if you walk up to our front porch, there's just a million wires. It's just embarrassing. So anyway, we have a problem with lights. That's that's our issue. I do think outdoor Christmas decorations is a core test of, you know, marriage, um, strengthening and loving each other unconditionally. Well, my husband laughed at me when I couldn't get the, you know, I was trying to have the fewest number of extension cords and he laughed at me thinking this was my usual. I mean, I have some deficiencies in the areas of packing yeah. cars and I mean, there. anyway, he then goes to try to do it and realizes, well, literally we don't have the right extension cords. So to be fair, some of it was we needed to actually go purchase some things that would have solved right. the problem. But I was mocked routinely for my efforts <laughs> until he tried it. Well, it is. Christmas decorations are something you have to come together as spouses and do teamwork. And, you know, it's like a joint project. It's very important. You both take a lot of pride in it. I will share one funny story. Uh, my husband, Michael, and I were very excited that we, this year, we're in a new house. And we put our first outdoor Christmas decorations out. Now, we may not have a lot of basic inside, but, you know, we got the outdoor Christmas decorations. <laughs> um, so we were very excited to get this wooden red color joy sign with a little major thing in the middle of it so he's out there struggling putting it in and everything and this neighbor walks by and goes not having so much joy with the joy huh <laughs> that does kind of summarize how that works you're you're supposed to be lighting the world and be happy and sometimes it's not a happy experience and then i was you know i said michael were you did you give a grumpy response and he's like maybe and i said oh, um you're gonna have to bring in the joy for the neighbors if you put joy out <laughs> Yeah, that actually, it's like putting a, um, a cross in the back of your car, but maybe you don't exactly. drive so well. It's like joy outside. And now you got to actually exude joy. Yeah. Well, last week, we talked a lot about these huge pro-life cases before the Supreme Court. But one thing that's not been talked about so much is that the Supreme Court is also weighing in on some pretty important school choice issues. In fact, just a few days ago, the high court heard oral arguments on a case involving parents in Maine who want the freedom to send their kids to Christian schools. And we'll get more into that in a minute. But first, I think we should just mention how what's going on right here in Virginia is leading more and more parents to look for other education options, especially when they just keep feeling like they're being blatantly ignored by their school districts. Yeah, when we talk about these things, we got to start in Northern Virginia because it's always there that sort of rises to the surface. So you've got this Fairfax County is just such a great example of this, where parents are repeatedly complaining about the books that are in their library that glorify these horrible things like pedophilia. I mean, they have been very vocal. And of course, ultimately, the school district then announces that they're going to keep these books in the library system. And so we shouldn't be surprised. You know, the stats come out the other day about school enrollment dropping. Is anybody surprised that Fairfax County actually is the number one? place where people have lost, where, where students are no longer going back to public school. So in the last year and a half, they have lost 10,000 students. That is 5.4% fewer kids enrolled in that whole system than were in, let's say, the beginning fall of 2019. That's incredible. And actually right behind it are all the other Northern Virginia schools. You got right. Prince William, then you got Loudoun County. It's a mess. And it's because they don't care what parents think. So they it, take their dollars elsewhere and their child. And it doesn't seem to be getting through. They just keep doing the same narrative, you know, like it's almost like they feel like they don't have to be accountable to these parents at all. And I think one sign of that we saw this week, which was just really crazy, 
Um, it was almost like they were trying to stick, you know, do the kind of stick your thumb in the eye, the parents kind of thing. I think it was Dolly Madison and Fairfax did this crazy display in their library. Literally, it, it just looked kind of crazy. It had these troll dolls, I guess is what they were, next to certain books. And guess what books they were? These very same books that the parents have been protesting that have this gratuitous pornographic pedophilia, glorification of pedophilia, those same exact books, same titles are sitting next to these troll dolls. But that's not all. Then you had a troll doll wearing a uh, hat with rainbow stuff all over it, holding the Bible. I mean, that does, I'm sorry, but it does seem like a pretty blatant kind of stick it in your eye and even mock Christianity kind of thing. Um, that whole display did mysteriously come down when Fox News started covering it. Yeah, it's no wonder parents are all leaving because it's not even, they're not even attempting to be subtle in the way that they're ignoring them. But the good news is on this front that we're getting closer to a day where everybody's going to have educational opportunities. I really believe that. So the reason I believe this is because just the other day at the U.S. Supreme Court, we had yet another school choice or educational opportunity case. Um, so we've had several of these, but the, the one that we just had was a case out of Maine. It's called Carson v. Macon. So you have to understand the background here that in Maine, there are areas that are so rural that they don't have the ability to provide a public high school to all of its citizens. And so actually, to help make up that gap for families that don't have that option right near them, the state actually provides a school choice that allows the parents to basically use funding to choose a private school. Now, here's the kicker. The state is only allowing parents to choose a private school for their kids that aren't, that isn't overtly religious, right? That they, they rule out faith-based schools in this. And so parents are arguing through their attorneys that that's a form of discrimination based on religion. You know, it, it is fascinating because I think I did hear in some of the arguments that they've allowed the parents to, you know, choose to send their kid to a private school that had chapel, but they actually determined that the chapel wasn't overtly religious. So that is them getting in there and comparing, to, you know, different forms of religion. That is discrimination, I think. And also what's so interesting is, is that this always seems to get back to the sexuality issues, which I think reveals a lot because you had the state's attorney general that was arguing against the parents. He was publicly bringing it to these sexuality issues. And then the, in the oral arguments, Justice Stephen Breyer brought up that essentially he was making this argument that school choice like, like this shouldn't be allowed because it allows public funding to go to schools that might have essentially a biblical viewpoint on sexuality. Now, the way he was framing it is that they would be able to ban gay students or teach, quote, that man is boss of the woman, unquote. I'm, I don't know what he was referring to there. Maybe some skewed view of biblical marriage role teaching. I'm not really sure. Um, but let's just listen to that part of the hearing for a minute. Well, there are, there are beliefs that no gay students, no gay teachers, the man is superior to the woman, and a few other things like that. Is that right? Uh, Your Honor, I don't know that it's correct to say no gay students. No, I don't believe that's the case. Do No gay they, teachers. Would they, uh, do the schools consider that in hiring decisions? Yes. But Wow. I mean, I think the attorney was actually doing a really good job holding his own there, you know, basically making it clear that the, the law actually has exemptions for religious people. You know, this idea that you're going to challenge something just based on whether it's too Christian in its views. And, and it's unfortunate how Breyer summed it up. Um, but I think actually what's interesting is later on you have Alito drawing out the point that, um, OK, so these kids aren't allowed to use funds to go to a, let's say, a faith based school. But they can clearly use funds to go to like a school that teaches critical race theory or he brings out white supremacy. So basically he's saying kids go to schools with ideologies all the time. You're just discriminating on which ideology you want those kids to have with state dollars that we should all be paying attention to. Exactly. It's like there's this pretense that public schools have zero indoctrination, zero bias, and that is just not reality. So that, yeah, it's an excellent point he was bringing out there. Well, and I think the the thing that people uh, tend to, to not realize is that when we stripped out any kind of connection to faith within the public schools, something was going to fill that void. And it has things like critical race theory and other other ideologies. There's never going to be a place that is value neutral entirely. That's not a thing. Um, the reality is that we have schools that teach ideologies and therefore people should be able to choose where they want to put their child, what they want to influence their child. And the thing that disturbs me about this effort to strip out something with biblical Christianity as an education option is that it 
it does further that message that Christianity can be marginalized or even ridiculed as kind of, you know, I would say Justice Breyer was ridiculing Christianity. So that just kind of underscores the same point for why parents are wanting these options, because they're finding Christianity marginalized and ridiculed in public schools. So it, in, in a weird way, kind of emphasize the need here. Yeah, without a doubt. We, we have a situation where there is this idea that faith-related things are harmful, and we have the secular left trying to shut down people's access to Christian schools, people's um, belief in these views that just aren't secular, and they, they have an, an ideology they're trying to force. Thanks for joining us for Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. If you're enjoying the show, help us encourage others to speak up by giving us a five-star review and sharing it with friends. Thanks for listening. Well, Victoria, just to kind of summarize the actual impact of this case for people, what are you most excited about with the outcome that, that we could possibly see here? Well, I think the timing of it, the fact that there's such a parent push right now and we're going to the General Assembly and we're going to be pushing educational choice and then you have the Supreme Court case in the background. I think that's what's really great is these legislators know the Supreme Court took this case and they heard, you know, they know the oral arguments. They know that they're they look like they're tracking our direction. And that just gives us momentum as we walk into our General Assembly and push for a furtherance of our of our educational options here. Yeah, let's talk about that a minute, what's happening right here in Virginia, because it's an interesting question considering that our new leadership is more open than ever before to empowering parents to have more of these education options. For instance, our new governor, Glenn Youngkin, specifically made it a campaign issue that he was going to push for opening some 20 new charter schools. Victoria, how much of that plan do you think will actually happen? And what is the Family Foundation specifically pursuing in this realm? Yeah. So, I mean, I love his enthusiasm. I love that he did make an educational opportunity issue out front on his campaign. He's a business guy. Business guys always love charter schools because they just look at the market and they go, why is there no competition? And so they naturally think we need a charter school. So I love that. Um, What he might not know is how difficult that has been in Virginia. We've had like seven, eight charter schools for decades and we can't make more because the law is so bad on how you create a charter school. So it's an uphill climb for him. I believe him. I think he can do it because I actually think he's a guy who gets stuff done. That's been my experience with him. But I would say this. We're also pursuing other things that probably have a better chance in our General Assembly. So, for example, the big thing we'd like to do is expand our – we have – in Virginia, we have an educational uh, improvement scholarship tax credit. This is something where basically a child can receive a scholarship – who needs that to go to a private school. They can get a scholarship and it's because people are donating and getting a tax credit. That is an awesome program. And right now there's about 5,000 kids benefiting from that. But we need to do some things that could expand that, get it to more kids. Yeah, the reason there's only 5,000 is because a lot of people in the state don't even know it. You know, under liberal leadership, it was kind of buried. And this is a unique opportunity to expand that. So I really hope that gets traction One way people can help get the word out on this is just letting people know in your area they can donate to these scholarships through foundations. One thing on our website that our Charlottesville Speak Up team set up is a way to help donate towards Charlottesville kids. So that's something on our website you could check out for an example, how to help build up that. Because we were talking about one way to strengthen this scholarship program and choices for parents is using this time to get more kids applying, donating more, because that makes it harder, you know, harder for to attack it later on. Yeah, it's easy to attack a program when there are not faces and stories and real human beings that are helped by that program. But when legislators have somebody in their district who is now thriving in their education as a result of this scholarship program, they can't, it's, it's real hard to fight it. And so the larger it is, the more kids that are helped, also the more stable the program is over the long term for when there are political changes in our General Assembly. So that's obviously one big piece. I do, I do want to also mention educational savings accounts because that's going to move forward. That's going to be a proposal. Um, and what that is, is is really the – it's just the easiest way. It's the simplest way. It's really where the dollars follow the child. And so what I mean by that is you can take a pool of money and just apply it to going to a private school. You could use it for homeschool. You could use it for tutoring. There are are so many options available to a parent when they simply get a pool of dollars and can decide themselves how they want to use it for their child. It would be amazing if we could see education savings accounts implemented here in Virginia. I personally know so many families that that, that would help. 
What do you think are the chances for that? Well, I think they're actually pretty good because we actually got this bill all the way to a governor's desk in the past. It's just it was a governor who vetoed it. So we've had some success. Now, we still always have an uphill climb in our Senate. Um, I think our House will pass this. I really do. Um, Our Senate is closely divided. And so we're going to work hard to get it to the governor. All right. So this is a matter of prayer, people. But also, what can people do to... Just back up what our policy team is doing at the state capitol to advocate for this stuff. What would you advise people they can do where they're at? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the first thing is right now when we're a little bit before the session has started, the easiest and most helpful thing people could do is go to our website at familyfoundation.org. And right on the top, there's this banner called Vision for Virginia. And that is where we lay out our principles. And if folks can, they can actually sign on to that. And what that does is it allows us to go to the General Assembly and say, this is the Virginia people are looking for. These are the kind of bills they want to see you supporting. And that gives it support. So I would say start there. But as we get to session, it's going to get a little bit more technical, right? So there's going to be bills moving. They move at a fast pace. And what we want folks to do is be on our email list so that when the school choice bills move, for example, they get an email right at that moment where we say a bill is going to this committee. Your legislator is a key vote. Please email them now. And if people are on our alert, they, they get that timely information. So you can sign up for those email alerts or we also do text alerts. Those are on our website. So we just want folks to kind of be in a position to be ready to be an effective activist. Yeah, make sure you sign up for all that because that's the way you can join your voice instantly to thousands of others and advocate with us for something like the Education Savings Account. Well, it's that time again. Time for our Inconceivable Moments Award. This is where we're featuring examples of the absolute lunacy and craziness that happens when cultural leaders try to give guidance completely apart from biblical principles. And we're calling this the Liberals' Most Inconceivable Moments Award. Inconceivable! Well, this week's inconceivable really is the definition of total absurdity, but in a really tragic way. Now we've gotten news that in Germany, where assisted suicide is unfortunately legal, the German Euthanasia Association has issued a new directive. Apparently, you cannot voluntarily commit suicide unless you are vaccinated first. And I'm serious here. They have actually issued a formal policy saying that these death doctors, so to speak, will not engage in bringing about the suicide wishes of anyone that's, that are unvaccinated or not fully recovered from COVID. Wow. <laughs> Um, I don't know where to begin with this, I, I mean, but I do have to appreciate a comment from one of the spectators uh, columnists who said, talk about a vaccine passport to the afterlife. You know, and it drew my attention to, you know, you think about New York City, you can't walk into a restaurant. This is, Can you walk into the afterlife? So I, you know, when you think about this, I, I mean, the last time I checked, I don't think our salvation status was going to be checked alongside with the vaccine status at the pearly gates. Yeah, they are really... Um elevating, exalting vaccination to a totally crazy level here. Um, But you would think that's the case, that it's almost like salvation status, like you said, with the way some people are trying to make it impossible to even eat, shop, or go to school without one. Now, let me just really make it clear that many of us in the office are vaccinated, including myself. So this is not coming from the perspective of trying to discount where everyone stands on this. But I do think even reasonable people can agree that we have clearly lost some basic logic here. Yeah, apparently the basis for this suicide policy is that the examination of someone's willingness or readiness to die requires, quote, human closeness. And so they have to protect themselves from COVID, especially when they're going to administer euthanasia drugs. I I just have to say, remember that during COVID, a lot of the elective surgeries have been put out, but we're still doing, apparently over in Germany, assisted suicide. Kind of unbelievable. Yeah, is that like an essential? So they think that's essential. I, I don't even. I don't want to go there. But what's also so ironic on so many different levels is, you know, we're bringing in, in this concept to justify this of human closeness. And I was thinking, we're bringing in human closeness now that they want to end their life. I mean, haven't we been hearing over and over in the news recently that the lack of human closeness during the COVID area, with all this social distancing, is actually creating more suicidal tendencies? You would think with all the things that have been put on pause during COVID, that the idea that we've been creating isolation, but we're still going to go forward with assisted suicide, which could be the result of someone's isolation from COVID. I can't believe that we, I'm thankful, thankful that I'm not hearing about this in the United States, that we don't have a lot of assisted suicide, that Virginia has been able to block assisted suicide, but boy, Germany has lost its way. 
Well, at the end of the day, I do think this exposes at its heart the reality that you can't have common sense, compassionate health care if it's completely divorced from a Judeo-Christian ethic of the value of life. And, and that's where you get this lunacy that we're ending up with here without that framework. Yeah, well, so I guess this does mean that we need to award this week's Inconceivable Award to the German Euthanasia Association for requiring a vaccine passport to death. Well, since it's the Christmas season, we can't just leave everyone on that really low down note. So I just want to remind everyone, for all of us, that even when things look their darkest, we do not despair because we know from Scripture that we trust in God as Savior who helps us. And maybe it's over time. But he helps us to exchange our spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise and our ashes for his beauty. With that, we leave you until next week. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time. And don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.